This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, and let me tell you, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be invited to give this uh, opening speech. During a distinguished career, Gerald Almer was a long-standing member of the Historical Manuscripts Commission and also served as the Commission's Chair. The work of the body continues today as part of the National Archives. As Acting Chief Executive of the National Archives, I'm also Historical Manuscripts Commissioner, so it's a particular pleasure uh, to be here today and to acknowledge the huge contribution that are uh, made by Gerald Almer to archives throughout the UK. The National Archives is the official archive of the UK government and for England and Wales. We're a non-ministerial government department and we're an executive agency of the Ministry of Justice. We lead the archive sector in England and we have UK-wide responsibilities to archives in private hands. But although we're very firmly a UK institution, we aren't parochial. And so today, I'm going to talk briefly about the National Archives and what it means to be, what it means to us to be part of a global archive. We're a national archive with a genuinely global perspective. And very simply, that perspective arises out of our records. The records we hold at the National Archives aren't simply a paper trail of the history of the UK. They contain shared histories. That is, they are records that help to tell the story of nations and peoples across the world. And here's an example. It's a document that is uh, often on display in the Keeper's Gallery, our on-site museum. And it has an extraordinary continuing potency, both as a, a record and a, as an artifact. To give it its catalogue title, it's the conveyance of lands by the Native American chiefs of the Five Nations, the Albany Deed of 1701. More usually, it's known as the Nanfan Treaty. The document uh, we hold is a copy of the agreement between John Nanfan, who was the acting governor of the then province of New York, and the Five Nations that comprised the Iroquois Confederacy at that time, and they were the Senecas, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cayugas, and the Mohawks. And this later became Six Nations uh, Confederacy with the addition of the Tuscaroras. The agreement gives uh, to William III the land northwest of Albany in return for hunting rights and the protection from the French. It is uh, signed at the bottom there with uh, animal totems, reflecting the history of each group and the personal characteristics of the individuals. So you can see that instead of uh, signatures, we've got uh, cattle and horses, and um, they reflect the, the, the different tribes. As you might imagine, uh, the treaty is not uncontroversial. The lands ceded by the treaty were disputed and the validity of the treaty, which was revised in uh, 1826, is not universally accepted. The impact of the treaty is still felt today and these disputes are still very much part of the contemporary uh, North American politics. And uh, here's a second example and um, one which I have a strong personal interest. Uh, this is from our passenger lists. Uh, this record is a list of passengers on the SS Ranchi, which sailed from uh, Sydney uh, uh, to London in 1951. It called at various countries uh, en route, between, uh, including Sri Lanka, or as it was known then, Ceylon. And one of the passengers on board was my father. Uh, seeing this record um, for the first time had a profound effect on me and my family's understanding of our own history. So his name 
Um, and just to the right, his age in 1951. He was 16 uh, years old, and um, he left uh, Colombo, Ceylon, to um, travel across the world to, um, to the UK to do some training at RAF Holton. And this was to, you know, a big career, career move for him. Um, subsequent records show his return to Sri Lanka in 1954. So three years later, 19 years old, and um, you can't see it quite, but he's uh, qualified as an air apprentice. So he's on his way. Um, and then his return um, on the Strathmore in 1959, and this time uh, he's accompanied by my mum. <laughs> so it, he, um, he obviously did a good sales job. Uh, he, he persuaded my mum uh, to marry and leave Sri Lanka, beautiful island, um, to arrive in the UK in October. Uh, and start their new life and new career. And my dad joined the uh, British Air Force. So um, our records tell stories that cross borders and oceans. They show how people moved and sometimes why they moved. They show where they settled and sometimes how they settled. And the global archive archives continue they grow. Over the last two years, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office has transferred to us its colonial administration records, also known as the migrated archives. Uh, the files contain material relating to colonial administrations in 41 former British territories. The transfer program in, uh, concluded late last year. The files are numerous and detailed, and it's too early to say how they're contents will affect our view of the period in our shared history. That will come through time and further scholarship. But the opening up of the migrated archive serves as a reminder that historical record is a dynamic thing. It is always the product of guidance and consequent decisions on what to save, what to destroy, and what to release. And those decisions themselves can have implications for our understanding of our history. A final example uh, is this photograph from our World Through a Lens uh, project, through which we digitized and made available online thousands of images from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, photographic collection. Uh, this photograph was taken at Entebbe, Uganda. That was really all the information supplied with the record when it was transferred to us. What we did through uh, World Through a Lens was to open up the images uh, to comments and tags, uh, in this case through social media, uh, Flickr. And through this we learned a huge amount more about the photographs and what they meant to people. So by virtue of these comments uh, that, that, that were tagged, we now know the characters in the photograph, the relationship between the people in the photograph, uh, a lot more. Um, World Through a Lens was a great success to us and helped us to reach wider audiences. It's also showed what we can do, what, what, what can be achieved when you give people a way to add information to our records. And we've built this capability um, to Discovery, which is our online catalogue. Uh, and as you can see here, um, we have tags uh, to um, 13,500 uh, 13 tags to nearly 26,000 records. And those tags are, are useful. The bottom right hand side gives some very useful references on how we can search and add rich uh, detail to, to the records that we, we have. But most recently, uh, the thing that has really captured people's imaginations around the world uh, is this. It's Operation uh, War Diary, 
and it's a, a collaborative project and we're working with the Imperial War Museum and Zooniverse to crowdsource the information held within our collection of First World War unit diaries. The extensive and global media coverage for this project has been thrilling. Uh, but what is really exciting is how, how people want to get involved. There were more than 150,000 visits to our website on the launch day itself. Just a week after its launch, more than 5,500 volunteers had tagged more than 100,000 pieces of information. It's quite addictive, but in a good way. And I'd encourage you all to get involved, and, and there will be more releases as we, as we move through the year. So it's clear that in the 21st century, a national archive have, can have increasing global relevance and reach. More records than ever before are available at the click of a mouse. And it's increasingly possible for users of archives, both family, historia, family history uh, researchers and academic researchers, to make a direct contribution to the way we organize and understand the records. But, and this fascinates me, the digital age hasn't reached people's desire, has not reduced people's desire to visit our building in queue. If anything, the reverse is true. Why? I'm not exactly sure, but here's my view. As much as our records are a world resource, and as much as the information that they contain has continuing relevance, and as much as they tell us about how, about how we came to be here and why, archives grant us a sense of physical connection with the past. In that moment of physical immediacy, the way we experience archives is not unlike the way we experience art or poetry or music. Archives aren't simply a resource, they're a treasure, and the world is fortunate to have them. I hope you have a very enjoyable and stimulating day. Thank you.